do with the fact that um, for the last several years, my husband and I worship with a program of Quakers. <laughs> <laughs>
Eastern Mennonite College in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And in the summers, he had exposure to Mennonites in Eastern Ohio when he worked on the muck farms in Hartville, even joining the Hartville Singers. There are more anecdotes I could share from that conversation, like the fact that my father wore a plain coat when he was in college and when my parents first met at father and my dad, but my mother wasn't wearing a covering. <laughs> Here is one thing I noticed, though, that I want to share. My mother, Elizabeth Ann Posta Oberry, also known as Beth, who'd grown up in a Mennonite congregation in a family that had been Mennonite for generations, had no awareness of these other stripes of Mennonites and Anabaptists who were right in her backyard, figuratively speaking. Because my mother was born and raised in Eastern Ohio, an ethnic Mennonite, and as far as she and her family were concerned, they were part of the community that defined who and what Mennonites were. All of these other stripes of Mennonites simply didn't register on their radar. They weren't actively ignoring them. They just didn't know they were there. Who do people say that Anabaptists are? Who do you say that Anabaptists are? Who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? The passage from Matthew that Ben read for us aligns with passages from Mark chapter 8 and Luke chapter 9. Referred to as the Messianic secret, these passages are obviously concerned with Jesus' identity. He's interested in the word on the street about who he is and what he's up to. But he's also interested in what the twelve think about this identity question, too. Willard Swartley explained to me that in Mark's version of this conversation, the important takeaway is that heaven knows who Jesus is, hell knows who Jesus is, but humans do not. <laughs> that viewpoint holds with Matthew's rendering. Jesus declares, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And then what happens? Jesus gives Simon a new name. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. Identity is a multi-layered and complex thing. Certainly, Jesus' identity as God and the person with ethnicity and tribal affiliation must have resulted in the occasional moments of existential crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Our names, that is how we are known, are significant parts of who we are. Luke tells us that when Gabriel appeared to Mary, he instructed her to name the baby Yeshua. God saves. What a powerful name. The practice of changing one's name at baptism and naming children after saints and martyrs was important to some early Christians, and the virtue of biblical names has been persuasive for many, giving me my baby's name is Jeremiah. But a name alone doesn't define our identity. I am more than a Linda Elizabeth Barry, even though I can talk at length about each of those names. Who do you say that I am? Who do I say that I am? More and more, I hear people qualifying their opinions and perspectives with a brief litany of their social location. Race, nationality, sex, sexual orientation, and class typically top the list of locators. And in this setting, we frequently hear the preface, I'm not from the Mennonite background. This practice has pluses and minuses. Being transparent about our place in society is a good thing because it means we are aware that there are differences with real consequences. Using the same demographic handles over and over, though, I think can undermine the depth of our identity and experience. For example, I guess that for many of you who have had children, being a parent has actually shaped you and your social location just as much or even more as any other locators. Yet how often do we hear people say, as a straight white father of two children, <laughs> My point is that social location is one place where who others say we are impacts our self-perception. Our identity isn't something we pour from a can or wear around our neck. Who we are grows from the interplay of who others say we are and who we other 
efforts to understand ourselves to be. Sometimes that interplay is playful, free, and affirming. Tree hugging, granola eating, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that interplay is contorting, distorting, diminishing. Tree hugging, granola eating, earth mama. I get why Jesus might have wanted to keep his identity, his true identity, a secret. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. Who do people say that Anabaptists are? Who do you say that Anabaptists are? Who do I say I am as an Anabaptist? I must confess that I find the discussions about Mennonite and Anabaptist identity a little bit trying, because we're, we always seem to be so intent on fixing something or solving a problem without quite knowing what's broken or why we can't find the right solution. Like many of you, I want to be able to say an Anabaptist, Anabaptist Christian is, and then finish the sentence with something smart, compelling, <laughs> but I can't, and neither can you. And that's not just good news, I think it's great news. I graduated from a college whose motto is Culture for Service. This names what I think Anabaptist Christianity is about. Seeing the world as God sees it, and using that vision to move compassionately toward others so that God's great shalom might be known throughout the earth. Theology and culture are woven together with the hope that the ways that we express ourselves open doors and build bridges. But here's the thing. I think this takes metallurgy as well as Christology. <laughs> to say that we follow Jesus isn't enough. Being Christian involves waiting on the Spirit. God's ministry in the Incarnation was particular. Jesus gathered together a band of disciples that was a rather motley crew, we know this. But it was also a culturally homogenous motley. The multiracial, multi ethnic, international, transnational celebration that is God's great shalom isn't necessarily modeled in Jesus' immediate community until the apostles are sent prior to Jesus' ascension into the whole world. <coughs> to catch the portrait of something more global and expansive, we think of Pentecost. While the crowd that had gathered to celebrate the feast of weeks or Shabbat was Jewish, it was made up of people from many nations who didn't speak the same language, but the Holy Spirit made it possible for them to communicate with each other with surprising clarity. I am a Christian because I have accepted Jesus' request that I be on hand for that which is at hand, but not yet in hand. <laughs> I got that from my theology professor, Chris, and I find it quick. Being Mennonite and being Anabaptist mean that when I show up, I do so grounded by a worldview that means I participate in God's, in the inbreaking of God's shalom nonviolently. To do so, I must receive the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is working in me, and I know this is true because I can see how far I have traveled and how far I have yet to go. But again, that's a different story for a different time. The unifying and healing power of Jesus' name is an important principle of Christian spirituality. But when it comes to opening up spaces in our hearts and congregations and institutional offices, that takes the work of the Holy Spirit, because it is the Spirit's work that allows us to relax and let go of control. The gift of, a holy, of, the gift of holy indifference from the Holy Spirit is what allows us to see ourselves as we truly are and allows us to show others who we truly are. Holy indifference is how Ignatius of Loyola described our posture of openness to God's will and moving. A good name is to be chosen that rather than great riches, and a favor is better than silver or gold. When John and I married, we left our names as they are, as they were. But some, but some among my sisters will assume that I am now Mrs. John Phillips Feltzfus. Mm -hmm. I think that some of John's sisters would be 
be mild and horrified if they realize that this is actually not the case. <laughs> the fact is, Melinda's false goose is a much more monotonous sounding name than I want to have. <laughs> We are learning. 